Now we're continuing our sport and history series. We have with us once again, Paul Rouse, professor at UCD School of History. Paul, how are you doing? You're very welcome. Thanks, William, Joe. Last time around, we talked about sport during the war years, effectively, and we're moving beyond that now. We're into 1922 and beyond, and we're focusing largely on Ireland. So if we're talking 1922 and Ireland and beyond and sport, then this is where we start talking about partition. We're looking at what happens to a sport and to sport in general and to sports people and to people who love sport when they live on an island which is partitioned in two. That is to say that they're under the settlement of, of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. There was the establishment of the Irish Free State and that Free State was up and running by early January 1922. Mm. At the same time, six northeastern counties of Ireland remain or become part of what is now called the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And this is, uh, previous to this, sport had been organised on an all-island basis. And the question now would be, what would happen to, to sport in this new political dispensation? And I don't suppose that Michael Collins and his team over in Westminster discussed sport at any great length? Are there any provisions for how sport should run in the country in the treaty? No, it's, it's not. This is, this is something that is uh, how sport is affected by, uh, by political events over which sports people have no control. It is not something that's considered. It's not, it's not relevant to the discussion. So we did, and, and that presumably is why we have different sports handling this in different ways. There wasn't a roadmap. There is no roadmap. There, are, there is no overarching solution. There is no, uh, and what happened with each sport depended on the peculiarities of that sport. It's the legacy of its history before 1922 and the decisions made by individual administrators as to how they would act and then react to events and circumstances as they changed over the, over the coming years. Has that held us back in any great way as a sporting nation, do you feel? Oh, I think there's there's no doubt that um, the partition. You you look, for example, at what has happened to soccer, and the manner in which there are two leagues on the island is a is a great example of the manner in which um, what should be what could be a much more competitive, much more um, I suppose interesting league if it was one United Ireland Soccer League and really domestic soccer in Ireland. It requires that the it requires the capacity to transcend the border if it's to to develop its potential even on its own terms, let alone with European competition. That's in the in the first instance. Second of all, there are for for many decades there was such a split in athletics, such a split in cycling, moved really impossible to field teams, and there were in some cases no teams fielded at all. Such were, were the level of disputes that took place. And then even within the GEA, the fact of the political border was a manifestation of the divides within wider Irish society, as in an all-Ireland society. And it emphasised the extent to which the GEA was something that was given to the, or belong, was belonging to the nationalist uh, section of Irish life rather than, rather than um, unionists. So let's uh, jump through these different sports then in various aspects of sport across this period. The Talchin Games, I know you want to talk to us about. The state established the Talchin Games. I vaguely know what these are. And generally, they only come up in brief conversations with yourself. So the Talchin Games, these were a big deal. These were huge in their day. When did these start? What was the point? What was the motivation behind them? So it's if you look at the countries or the states that have been formed in the last 20, 30 years, for example, after the fall of, of um, the Iron Curtain and the, 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 the fact that Yugoslavia split into different states, one of the first things all of those states did was to form international sporting teams to represent those new states and to compete in the Soccer World Cup, for example. You can see what it meant to Croatia back in France in 98 to, to go as far as they did, and so on across, across various sporting organisations and across the world. Mm. And what the Irish state did, the new Irish Free State, as an attempt to establish its legitimacy and to proclaim to the wider world 
that this was an independent state now in existence was it hit on this idea of forming or, or, of, of um, establishing and running what were called the Talchin Games. Now the Talchin Games, when they eventually took place in 1924, were bigger than the 1924 Paris Olympics in terms of the number of people who competed in them and the number of spectators who were drawn to the events. The events in the Talchin Games were competed for by Irish people born in Ireland or by members of the Irish diaspora who came to represent teams from South Africa and Argentina and America and Brit Scotland, Wales, England and so on. So this was a coming home of the tribes to celebrate Irish um, independence. The sports that they competed in were really interesting. There were competitions of, in hurling and football with teams drawn from around the world. There was a golf competition uh, for men and for women, tennis competitions similarly, and athletics competitions, basically the program of Olympic uh, athletics competitions. There was clay pigeon shooting, lawn bowling, and um, kind of most... Or interestingly enough, there were airplane races, which began in the Phoenix Park. I'll come back and talk about those um, as well. And we'll talk also about the fact that soccer and rugby were excluded and so were cricket and hockey. And they were political statements and they're related to the origins of this idea. So where did the idea come from? The idea was, the idea came right out of the, the playbook of Irish nationalism. And it was said that the original Talton Games had lasted from 632 B.C., until 1168 AD, and that they were to celebrate the life of Queen Talcha. There were her funeral games, and Queen Talcha being one of the great kind of goddesses of, 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 of Irish history. And the 1168 is the finishing date. That's to say that it was the following year, 1169, that the English first came. So this was to say now in 1922, initially, we've survived these 800 odd years of colonization and conquest. Our civilization triumphs, and we are going to celebrate the fact of our survival by reviving these games. Now, the idea of revival had first come to pass in the 1880s. It was something that was promoted, promoted by people like Michael Davitt, the Land League leader, and the GEA had gotten behind it at that stage. But bringing it back in 1922 was a government, a cabinet minister called J.J. Walsh. J.J. Walsh had first come to prominence as a member, a leading member of Cork GEA in the 1910s. He was in the GPO where he fought for the Irish Volunteers in 1916. And he was later, as a cabinet minister, the man who most famously had the paint box, uh, the post boxes in Ireland turned from red to green. He got all the post boxes painted green. And he was the man who was the founding uh, cabinet minister, dri the driving force behind the establishment of 2RN, the national radio station, in 1926. But it was Walsh who in 1922, less than a month after the Irish Free State was formed, who said, we're going to do this. We're going to hold this Olympiad, this Irish Olympiad, and we're going to draw people from around the world, and we're going to film it, and we're going to send cine reel footage everywhere to say what we're going to do. So he got money out of the Department of Finance to fund this, including £10,000, a huge sum of the time, which was given to the GEA to redevelop Croke Park in order that um, it could host the opening and closing ceremony and the athletic events. And he worked at it assiduously with his committee, using the model of the Olympic Games through 1922, through, through those early months of 22, through the spring and into the early summer, until there was a disaster. The dispute within the Irish nationalists who had fought for independence, which had led to civil war, flared out into the open in June 23, but still Walsh reserved, reserved. There may be street shooting in Dublin, the GPO may be inflamed, but still we will continue. We are going to hold these games. Finally, the, the, the idea died in July 22 when the American team said, listen, we're not coming. This, this is not feasible for us to do this. So they were deferred until after the civil war and it was 1924, August 1924, before it was possible to stage these games. It sounds like an extraordinary success if in their first effort they had more numbers than the Paris Games. Yeah, it's, it's, what they did was, was really clever. I, I said earlier that it was competition between Irish people and the Irish diaspora community, and it was that. But the organisers, JJ Walsh, he was sensible enough to understand that they needed a little bit of stardust thrown in it. So they contacted the American team 
who are coming back from the Paris Olympics, got them to stop in Cove, put them on a train, got them in, got them to come to Dublin. So the diver Eve, Reeve Richmond, the high jumper Harold Osborne, and the swimmer Johnny Weismuller were, the, were, were involved. And this got a huge amount of both local and international. And then to, actually, the story of Weismuller. Weismuller had won the Olympic 100 metre gold medal for swimming in the, um, Olympic, in, in the Olympic Games in Paris. And he most famously later went on to, um, to act as Tarzan for many years. He was the first Tarzan in Hollywood who became hugely famous at that. When he competed, he won gold in the Talchon Games in swimming as well. But the finals for those Talchon Games um, swimming competitions were held in the pond in Dublin Zoo. And I think there's something wonderful about the idea of Tarzan winning gold in, in, in swimming past the monkeys in Dublin Zoo. So it's this idea, though, that, that you... You bring stardust in and you don't just, it's a celebration of Irishness and you cleave to Irish sports and you exclude those foreign sports yeah. of rugby and soccer. But at the same time, what were the most popular competitions? The most popular competitions were the mo motorcycle races, which were dominated by riders who crossed the border and came down from Ulster, where motorcycle racing was already established as a hugely popular sport. And the most popular of all, the airplane racing. So these new planes bought by the Irish Free State um, um, Air Force ran a competition in which they took off in the Phoenix Park and they raced at three points. They took off, they went by the Wellington Monument, they went out to Clondalkin and turned the tower and they went over the Hellfire Club in the Dublin Mountains and raced back. And this was just an enormous spectacle in a world where a whole lot of people you know, were seeing planes close up for the first time. And just to add a little bit of a luster to it, they built a mock castle in the corner of, um, of, of the Phoenix Park out of wood. And along, in that wood, they put anti-aircraft gunfire, which they set up these mock bullets, which made a crackling noise when you fired them, to protect them from these planes who were coming back. And the planes bombed that mock castle using plaster of Paris bombs as a sort of spectacle. And this, again, got huge publicity for these games. So well received, no criticism. This was just a, a, a thorough success. Absolute criticism from loads of people, as there always is criticism of everything that anybody does, they get criticized for it. So the view was that what are we doing? Lo loads of, of the GPO hasn't been rebuilt. There is rubble still around the main streets of Dublin. There is, a, there's, there's a, been a strike. So there's rubbish everywhere uh, on the streets. There's an electrician, there's an electric strike. So there's candlelight in all the hotels. What are we doing having a sporting spectacle when there is so much left uh, to be done here? Mm -hmm. And then there was the usual sneering. There were so many competitions that it seemed to be relatively difficult not to win a medal in the, in the Talchon Games. So there were cartoons in the papers about you know, the various categories at which you could get a medal for. This was the ultimate sport for all in, 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 in 1924. And of course, Behind it all lurks the politics of it. This was an event which was utterly associated with the new free state, and that means with the coming the nail government. So therefore, those anti-treaty forces did not accept it. They did not wish for it. They did not want, they did not want to have any sort of, of, of a part to it. Okay. So how many times did this happen then, the Talchon Games? How many games did we have? 24 was a huge success. Sorry, 24 was a huge success. 28 was le less successful, still a success, but not too bad. But Fianna Fáil are in power by 32. It's too late to cancel the game, so they let them run a little bit. And then De Valera, Eamon De Valera killed the games. And he essentially killed them by that grand masterstroke of putting together an interdepartmental government committee. And that interdepartmental committee reported in... 1935, then 1936, and it was too late by 36 to, to put them together for these things. So they were essentially killed by stealth. J.J. Walsh was appalled. Mm. He just thought, so many people have given so much to this and you just kill them because it's, it's, not, your, it's not your thing. It's too much associated with what happened before. So and is it that simple? Dev came along and said, you pro-treaty types came up with this idea, therefore I don't like it. 
inevitably it wasn't presented as being that simple but ultimately that's how it was done this is the this is the uh, the year zero of the re new revolution is Fianna Fáil in power in the early 30s. But um, it That's should be said, by the way, we, we, we could be closing down on the 100th year anniversary. We, we could be. We could be doing that. But we could also, um, there was a shift in focus. And there was the idea that instead of the mere Talchin Games, that what we would look for was would be to stage the Olympic Games. So there was the plan that we would stage the Olympics or we would look to stage the Olympics in in, in 1940. But where we 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 didn't get that Tokyo was were, were awarded the um, the games and the the idea of Ireland then or a city would be Dublin staging the games just fell away. Okay. So let's talk other sports then. In the midst of partition, soccer is the obvious one, given that we have the IFA and the FAI. How quickly did that happen? Is this acrimonious from? the first moment of partition or is it a seamless enough thing? How did all this go? Oh, it wasn't seamless. This was just nicely bitter uh, yeah. from the very beginning. And it was actually before 22 that the split happened. The split was happening from um, just be around through that decade of revolution between 1913 to 1921. Soccer was being pulled apart. The national team had been really successful in 1913, but there were no international matches from 1914 onwards. And after the outbreak of the Great War, it was no longer possible to play a national football league. So there were the Irish Football League disbanded. And, the, and what you were left with by 1919 were cup competitions. So the, the Irish Cup, the, what we now know as the IFA Cup or the FAI Cup, was restarted in 1919. And it immediately, or sorry, in 1919, it became a huge point of controversy between people who ran the game north and south. There was a match, a semi-final in that competition between Glenavon from Lurgan, um, not too far from Belfast, and Shelburne from Dublin. And the first game of the semi-final, the, 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 the match was a draw. And it was played in Belfast. And by precedent at this stage, the second leg, the, the replay, should have been played in Dublin. But the IFA, under presumed pressure from Glenavon decided no the second leg would be played in Dublin as well and mm -hmm. Shells refused to play and, and there was a huge dispute so this signalled that there was a split coming between Leinster and Ulster and it was and that it was it was it was serious and what happened in 1921 was there was a meeting of the Leinster Football Association in the early summer of 1921 and they decided that they were seceding from the um the, from the Irish Football Association. They would no longer recognise its writ and uh, they would run their own competitions, that they were not going to be ruled from Belfast where the Irish Football Association was based. So they were just simply not having it. This, this, this was going to be it. And they decided at a meeting, first of all, so it was the 8th of June, 1921, when they decided to set up their own league and um, it was eight Dublin clubs that were, were, were in that league. And those... People then came together on the 2nd of September, 1921. So the centenary of the Football Association of Ireland is next year. Um, and it's the 2nd of September, 1921. They decide to, um, to form a separate body. And that year, from, from that autumn of 21, before even the Free State is up and running, there is, right. a, separate, there is a separate football competition. The IF, the, the, there's, a, there's a, a southern version of the IFA Cup. Right. And by early 22, so in March, in late March and early April 1922, or in April 1922, the IFA Cup and the FAI Cup finals are played within a week of each other in the spring of that. And this is the symbolic moment where they're different. So are you telling me potentially if in, when Collins went over and if he'd come back with 32 counties, no partition, there was still a split in Irish football north and south? There was a split which would not have been of the same nature yeah. because of the fact that administration would have been based along the borders. But there were already huge disputes okay. between, between North and South. This had been going for a while. At a Leinster, they used to play interprovincial inter soccer matches between each other in the same way as happened in, in rugby. Mm -hmm. And at, at the match in 1919, one of the Northern players was attacked in Dublin after the game. And this fueled more tensions. There were teams st stoned by rival supporters north and, north and south. And in the north as well, there were running battles between, with gunfire being, um, being shot between uh, Belfast Celtic and Linfield, for example, and, and so on uh, around, 
around the city. So soccer was really divided. And initially, initially, Belfast Celtic and other clubs uh, professed their allegiance to the Football Association of Ireland or the Football Association of the Irish Free State, as it was mm. from the very beginning. And how quickly did they say, did the two associations settle down into something uh, resembling what we have today and a good or a reasonable working relationship? Well, they didn't play each other in an international match between until uh, 1978. So that tells you that that this was a long time in the coming. But so you look at it, you look at it two ways. And sorry, first of all, would they, would, they, would they never have been allowed to be drawn together in a World Cup qualifier or a European qualifier? Well, we'll come back to the domestic stuff. Let's look at the, what happened with the international team. So, okay. first of all, what, what happened was almost immediately, and this doesn't feed into soccer's narrative that it had no place in independent Ireland. It was pushed to the margins. Of course, it was poorly treated in certain schools and in certain places, and, and there were difficulties there. But immediately, or almost immediately, the Football Association of the Irish Free State was accorded recognition by the government as the governing body for soccer. Right. on the island and what they did was they set about establishing an international team and they looked for recognition from the international football association board that body based in london and they were denied it because it said you can't have an island where you have two representative bodies claiming control over both of them and they were basically rejected from that so then they applied to fifa hmm. fifa had been established um in in was only 20 years old at that stage so fifa and they had designs to stage a soccer competition at the 1924 Paris Olympics, which they duly did. So the Football Association of the Irish Free State, under the imprimatur of the government, fielded a team in that competition. Now that team, because of the nature of the Olympics at the time, did not include any of the best Irish players who were all playing professionally. It had to be just amateur players who were playing in the country. But feel they did, and they beat Bulgaria in their, in their first match before losing, but before they went out, they were kind of entreated. These were the representatives of the state going out and a newspaper sport uh, said at the time, for these players, their uppermost and inseparable thought must be their country. Their country expects them to do their duty to play as Irishmen, to win as Irishmen, and if the worst comes to the worst, to lose as Irishmen fighting unflinchingly to the last. So this was a team going out to be emblematic of the nation, but of course this was a nation that did not have its symbols worked out at this stage. It wasn't clear and wouldn't be clear until the end of the 1920s what the national anthem was. So they took the, the anthem that they used was Thomas Moore's Let Aaron Remember, a, a less than, uh, well, you wouldn't describe it as stirring. Um, the jersey they wore was blue. They wore a blue jersey with a spray of shamrock on it. And this was not, competing in the Paris Olympics was not the start of a glorious, um, for, for a glorious kind of set of sequences over the years. For over the rest of the 20s, they played an average of one game a year, and that was it. And it was only in the 30s when they began to enter World Cup qualifying campaigns in 34 and 38 mm. that they began to get a regular series of matches. But there's something fundamentally fascinating that was happening at the time. Both the Irish, both the, the, the team called Ireland that represented the Free State and the team called Ireland that represented the six counties, both of those teams claimed to be called Ireland and both claimed jurisdiction to pick all the players on the island that they so wished. So between 1922 and 1950, more than 40 players represented both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland as they became known, but both were called Ireland at the same time. It was utterly farcical at certain times. Johnny Carey, the great Man United captain and one of the greatest soccer players that Ireland has ever produced, actually played for both teams within the space of three days of each other, having captained both of them. Mm. This is, thing, and it was only in 19, after 1950 when it became clear that Northern Ireland were now going to, or what became known as Northern Ireland, were going to enter World Cup qualifying competitions, that the split was made, brokered by FIFA, uh, that, that you must pick from, from either side of the border, not from both. Okay. Can we move on to rugby or is there anything else you want to say to wrap up? No, uh, just, just in, in terms of domestic soccer, I yeah. think it's important to say that... Yeah, because we're, we're still grappling with the domestic situation. The deal brokered by FIFA allowing the, the Football Association of the Irish Free State to, to, um, to affiliate was brokered on the grounds that the Football Association of the Irish Free State would 
not take teams from north of the border. And that was the deal that was done, and that's what happened. So a kind of an uneasy truce settled in, whereby the, the border was the border when it came to sporting competitions. Oh, there was a singular exception, though, in soccer, and that is the inter-university soccer championships, which, of course, gives the lie is soccer being just a game of the working classes. Because if you went to college in the 1920s and the 1930s, you were middle class. Well, there's a, it's, we're, we're at an interesting point at the moment. I mean, the Satanta Cup tried to revive cross-border competition and increasingly, certainly down here anyway, and the likes of Brian Kerr has been involved and Niall Quinn's talked about it, there is a movement towards an All-Ireland, 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 I suppose, as well, league. And maybe in the next 10 years, we're at that point. I don't know. But uh, it's interesting talking about this now. There are, there are echoes uh, of the past being, being talked about at length now. It would be, it, I think, for, for on a purely sporting sense, it's difficult to see how it does not make sense to organise soccer on an All-Ireland basis in terms of... I think yeah. That doesn't mean that someone doesn't get to hold on to whatever nationality they hold or what, how they perceive themselves. Yeah. But on a purely sporting sense, how can representing a club in an All-Ireland competition compromise your nationality? What about rugby then? That seems like a more straightforward situation. There's no split. Yeah, rugby, rugby was really um, a different story. Um, rugby decided not to split. Rugby, rugby stayed together and rugby staying together involved people swallowing hard and making sacrifices around matters of symbols. And also, that's the first point. The second point, it also is reflective of the fact that there were people who ran rugby south of the border, what became the border, who are utterly, comf utterly comfortable within the context of the British Empire and who indeed most likely lamented the passing of that empire's presence in yeah. the South. So, for example, this meant that you, the compromise that came to power was that Ravenhill was redeveloped in the 1920s so that what were then the two home matches in the Five Nations Championship, one would be played in Belfast and one would be played in, in Dublin. Mm. And when it came to the flying of flags, the IRFU didn't fly the tricolour during these years in the 20s. The IRFU designed its own flag, which it flew from 1925 onwards. And it was only in the 30s, and when there was a massive um, kind of swell of criticism from 1932, driven by, uh, well, coming initially actually from the rugby club in University College Galway, who said, listen, our rugby team plays in Lansdowne Road. It is an insult that the tricolour is not flown when they play. So it may be flown. It should be flown. And this gathered momentum through the newspapers and there was sustained political pressure most from certain politicians uh, and from clubs across Munster and parts of Leinster as well to say, look, this can't go on. This border is, you know, they, we're not in the empire anymore. You may fly the flag. And this happened. But it was really, really difficult to preserve a unity with, within rugby. And a great example is Sunday play. So no, there was no Sunday play in, in, in Ulster. And it's actually interesting. I think Ulster play a lot of their matches still on Friday evenings. They do, yeah. But that whole idea of Sabbatarianism and not playing sport on a Sunday was, was writ large there. But it was also applied across Leinster and across Munster. Rugby, the day for rugby was Saturday. Now, Leinster, or Munster in particular, just stepped away from that and began to play games on, on the Sunday. That's the first point. The second point is the ties with the empire were writ large. So, for example, 1935, the funeral of King George, rugby matches in Munster are cancelled because it coincides with his funeral. So this is a world. Mm. This is a world where people find it very hard. Things don't just change in 22 because of um because of you 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 put a border and you give a new flag and you do that it takes time for things to 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 settle down and what makes this possible within the IRFU is the devolved provincial structure so just as in, in the 1990s the IRFU got really lucky by having this structure which allowed them pro to professionalize so it is in the 1920s and the 1930s they were able to say to the people of, who, who are north of the border say, okay, you just take Ulster and you run rugby in Ulster. That's your domain. We won't interfere domestically and there's no real All-Ireland competition anyway. So that's, that's just left there. Hmm. And, and it stays like that on until the 1950s 
it stays like that, that there's a game north and south of the border. And then it changed in the 1950s when a group of Munster rugby players decided that they would not walk out onto Ravenhill and stand for God Save the Queen as the home anthem being played up in, in Belfast. Mm-hmm. And that started a train of events which tied in with a redevelopment of Lansdowne Road and the basic fact that by 1954, every time a rugby international was played in Belfast, it cost a loss of income of €3,000 to the Irish Rugby Football Union, which is a huge amount of money in the middle of 1950. So from 1955 onwards, Lansdowne Road became the venue, the sole venue, essentially, for Irish home international matches. Okay, very interesting. Because I do remember a couple of years ago, before one of the World Cups, there was an Irish international warm-up game at Raven Hill, and there were yeah. murmur- murmurings from some quarters that you do realise, by right, we should be playing God Save the Queen before this, because we're in Raven Hill. And if it's, if it's here, then that's what happens. Yes, and, and this thing rumbled on. And you look at the anthem that Ireland, the Irish rugby team, stood for before the 87 World Cup. It's an amazing footage of it. And the Rose of Tralee is, of yeah. course, a wonderful tune, but I'm not too sure it's representative of, of, uh, of, of, of the Irish Rugby Football Union. Yeah. But these are, these are the things, these are the things that, that makes it so international sport depends upon borders and it depends upon the symbols mm. of a state being represented on, by the team, on the jerseys, on the, on the anthems, on, on the flag, everything. Yeah. And that's just not possible when you have an all an all Ireland team. Which brings us to GEA then as well. So the GEA certainly didn't look at the six counties and say, "Well, let's clear out of here." They absolutely said, "Well, we're sticking our flag down and we're going to keep on playing." Yeah, and the story of the GEA is that it, like rugby, remained in, uh, a cross border sport, but what it wasn't was cross community. Yeah, in the sense that the idea that there was large-scale unionist involvement north of the border after 1922 is just not realistic. It just did not happen. And the GA still had its ban rules. Indeed, it strengthened its ban rules. These are the rules that prevented people who play rugby, soccer, cricket or hockey joining the GA or anybody who watched those games uh, couldn't be a member of the GA or anyone who attended dances by those games could not be a member of the GA. Hmm. So anyone who's involved in, in... So the ban rules were still in existence but the GA quickly in the south of the border quickly found a really um, warm accommodation within the new free state and it created this story around itself that it was central to the winning of independence as we spoke about last week mm-hmm. and that it fitted snugly within the imagery and the iconography of this new um, free state and it just basically began to invent things for its own ends but it did practical things as well. We'll talk about the inventions in, in a second, but in a practical sense, the GEA, when the government tried in the late 20s and early 30s, tried to implement an entertainment tax on sporting organisations, the GEA lobbied successfully against it. But it didn't just lobby for itself, it lobbied also against soccer and rugby. They said, they should pay, but we shouldn't have to pay. So these were, this was a raw a raw kind of narrative of competition between the two. And it comes basically to the fact of what was the point of the revolution? For many people, this was not just about the paint boxes being green or taxes flowing to Dublin rather than London or being able to elect a TD rather than an MP. Mm -hmm. There were people who wished for this to be a cultural revolution. They wished for this to be the creation of an Irish speaking state where it was Irish music and Irish games and Irish literature, Irish publications in general, which triumphed. And that meant pushing out the others. Mm. It didn't mean just existing beside, but for too many, it meant pushing them out. Mm. And these are many of them really decent human beings, people who really believed in, in what they were doing, but just had this kind of sense of, of national mission around how they perceived the GEA. And it brought them into positions of extraordinary contortion. So for example, the newly elected president of Ireland in 1938 was Douglas Hyde, who, as part of his new um, new position, attended a soccer match. Now, Douglas Hyde was the founder of the Gaelic League, an Irish speaker who was a friend of Michael Cusick's, who had promoted hurling in the beginning and was a patron of the GEA. Ban him now. Ban him now and ban he wa- banned he was. He was not. The, he was patronage was removed from the association in you're 38. Kidding. You're kidding. Because 
no man could be said to be residing above the rules was the thing. So that's what happened in, in 38. But this was all of a piece as what was happening in the repositioning of, of the GEA's history. So until 1931, Hill 16 in Croke Park was known as Hill 16. Oh, I say Hill 60, yeah. called after a battle in the First World War. Not, as people would say, built from the rubble of the 1916 Rising. Actually, if they had managed to build it from the rubble of the 1916 Rising, it would probably be the most extraordinary achievement in Irish sport in history, considering it was opened in November 1915. But anyway, they, they story, it was called Hill 60 in the same way that the Cop in Anfield or in um, Sheffield Wednesday's ground, uh, Hillsborough, um, was called after a battle in the Boer War. There was kind of precedent around this. The newly constructed mound on Crow Park was seen to resemble Hill 60, a battle or was a battle which was then being fought for in the First World War, where there were members of Irish people fighting in the British Army who were, who were there. Letters home was all over the newspaper. So it began to be called Hill 60. Until 1931, Dan McCarthy, IRA man and GA member from president, stood up and said, look, it's an outrage that a part of one of our fields, which has been stained by the martyred blood, obviously referenced to Bloody Sunday, mm. should be called after a, a foreign battle fought by a foreign army in a foreign field of which we had no part. Mm -hmm. And they decided to change his name to, to Hill 16. And the story grew. Actually, the best part of the story is January 1966. Um, this Raymond Smith, one of the most famous journalists of the late sec sec second half of the 20th century in Ireland, was writing in the Sunday Independent and he went out of his office in the middle of Abbey Street into the Oval Bar and he was having a pint in the middle of writing his comments before he went back in. And he was sitting beside um, a carter, a man, an old man in Dublin drinking a pint and they were talking away. And Smith was ready to write, look, finally I found it. He said, I met a man having a pint this evening who told me that he was paid a shilling a load for bringing the rubble from the 1916 Rising up to Croke Park to, um, to build Hill 16. Um, so stories, stories, it comes down to the capacity of history to compete with the power of men drinking pints in pubs telling stories. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a repeated challenge. The GA don't exactly crow about the fact these days that they slap down the first president of Ireland, do they? No, it's it's um, it's uh, I suppose it's what's filed under a complicated part of yeah. of, uh, of of history. Yeah, it's funny when because see, you see, I grew up, uh, I was born in eighty five, so like in the nineties, I vividly remember being at my local GA club as a kid and right through my teenage years, and it was often the place where me and my mates or me and my dad went to watch soccer matches. So I watched many a Champions League final in the GAA pub. I watched the O2 World Cup in the GAA. Uh, when, yeah. when did that become socially okay? Like, in the 1980s, would the barman have looked at me and, 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 and told me to get the hell out? So, so two things happened. First of all, everything was transformed by television from 1962 onwards. Okay, we should step back from that and say, first yeah. of all, there are a huge number of GAA members who had no truck with any of these rules, who essentially avoided the ban rules, found their ways around them all the time. They played soccer, they played rugby, they didn't regard you as a lesser Irish person if you yes. played any other game other than GAA. So that's, that's the starting point. The second point is you have to look at these men within the context of their times and the contortions that they tried sure. to cleave to something that they genuinely believed in. So this is not just to condemn them or to paint them into a certain No, no, I'm, I'm just asking when it changed, when the mindset changed. Oh, yeah, sure, sure yeah. I'm just, I just wanted to get that caveat, caveat in yeah. uh, there. But it changed, it began to change, really change from the 60s. 60s. Because you got to a position where I could go to Daly Mount Park and watch the FAI Cup final between Bowes and Shamrock Rovers and I get banned because someone from a GEA vigilance committee has seen me there and I'm in bother. But you stay at home and watch it on telly yes. and you're grand. The 66 World Cup is all over Irish television. All of this happens, so television makes it now a nonsense that you can't do this. And there's a momentum driven by a man called Tom Wolfe from um, 
the civil service club in Dublin, Kerry man based up here, big GEA man who drove this campaign through the 60s, which gathered more and more momentum until 1971, when the ban on the playing and watching of foreign games was removed from the GEA's rule book at a Congress in, in Belfast. Mm. So that, that is the first step in, in this process of you sitting happily as a child um, uh, watching, in these, watching in these bars. The second stage is a huge building of community centres by the GEA through the 70s and the 1970s and the 1980s. There was a dramatic repositioning of the GEA in the 1970s where it sought to build community centres and build its place as a community organisation. That language of community organisation stems from the 70s. And of course, once you build these facilities, you need your membership to come to those facilities. Mm -hmm. And the membership of the GEA were hugely interested in soccer matches, hugely interested in rugby matches, interested in anything. Mm. and interested in going to a place where they're familiar. And that explains why so many went to, to, uh, to watch those centres as, as, as well, presumably, as the cheaper drink. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Okay, so there's a degree of pragmatism there, but probably a bit of enlightenment as well and the changing of the times. Uh, what about other sports then? We can't cover everything here. And, we, you know, we, we're going up to, what, 50s, 60s uh, yeah, territory here. Up from, up the 70s, yeah. yeah, okay, so... 1920s post-partition uh, things. What, what other sports do we want to talk about here? Because cricket obviously isn't as popular as it was. That was something we talked about a lot when we were in late 19th century. So yeah. what are the big pursuits after GEA rugby and soccer that we should mention and, and how they evolved? So the first thing to say is that almost every sport in the country grew exponentially in these years. Right. The GEA went from 1,000 clubs in 1920 to 2,000 clubs by 1940 and 2,500 by 1960. The number of rugby clubs grew, the number of soccer clubs grew. It was amazing with soccer. Soccer began to spread out right out to the margins through all country towns, through many, most country towns, and in, even into rural areas during these years. There was a huge boom yes. in in, in the playing of, of these games. And but sorry, to, other... sorry to interrupt there briefly. I, in, like in my experience, certainly growing up, soccer and GEA uh, sat very nicely together in that we generally played our GEA in the summer and soccer was the September to May season. Yeah, it, it's depending on where you are in the country and what infrastructure is there and how well those organisations are. Mm. And of course, um, it depends on the when you played your games, depend on how successful your team was in the All-Ireland uh, Championship, not to have a poker career. But that's just, uh, that's just the, way, the, way it, uh, the, way, the way it worked. The, the calendar, GA calendar, as uh, the, the Club Players Association show again this week, it's a mess. Yes. Um, yes. So, so that, that was, we're not going down that rabbit hole no, now, no, but no. it is something to, to, to be aware. But if you look at other sports, yeah. hunting, Hunting grew more hunting and more hunting in Ireland through the twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties. After the red coats have gone, the, 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 so so these are these are a new elite begin to push into hunting and and displace those. But there is still a connection, an international connection. You look at something like the Westmead Hunt Ball from the nineteen sixties. There are Europe. There's European royalty attending these events, and Ireland is still a cherished place to hunt. And there's no massive hunting anti-hunting lobby here for a long long time in comparison with other with other countries horse racing sure. is fundamental not just as a sport but as an industry in 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 the country and of course horse racing accommodated itself immediately absolutely immediately to the new dispensation it was it was it professed its great disappointment at the death of michael collins in 22 it ran a horse racing meeting in the Phoenix Park to raise funds for the injured, for the dependents of injured or dead IRA men who'd fought in the War of Independence. So this sport that was utterly associated with the British military flips now and establishes itself in a new dimension. And horse racing, racing remains in Ireland, the sport that the state gives most money to. And we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit next week. But it is the story of horse racing is the sport of, of so many people. It's a huge day out for people in every area. It draws together all classes um, into the stands um, with everything that that brings. So horse racing uh, is really, really successful in independent Ireland. Okay. Uh, last point then, to wrap all of this together, and we'll pick it up next week. Along with all of this, the media grows. I mean, you mentioned television there. Attendances presumably grow. Sports people become heroes in this period yeah. that we're talking about say 1920 up to approaching 1970 what do you want what do you want to say about that look at this in 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 two ways first of all there's the transformation that was wrought by radio so 
up till the 20s, results, commentaries were sent through the newspapers afterwards yeah. or by telegram. You could get sent a telegram to a place and word would spread beyond that. Now the immediacy of radio. One of the first broadcasts of a live sporting event in Europe and the first in Ireland was the All-Ireland Hurling semi-final between Galway and um, Kilkenny in 1926. And from that moment onwards, sport became an essential part of, of Irish radio. So the first broadcast was by P.D. Mehigan. And then there was a succession of broadcasts, but radio was a cherished medium. It, 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 was, it was a contested space. So for example, Eamon de Barra was commentating on a match for 2RN in 1933, the All-Ireland football final between Cavan and Galway. And two IRA men came in and put a gun to his head and made a broadcast on behalf of Republican prisoners. So after that, there was security placed around these mm. boxes. But from, from 39, uh, 38 and then 39, Michal O'Hare launching his career, first of all, and then becoming the voice of, of Gaelic games and of horse racing on, on Irish radio during, during these years. And radio through the 30s, but especially through the 40s, 50s, and even well into the 60s, is the dominant medium as more people get sets and as, as the transmission of radio signal around the country gets, gets better and it creates ce celebrities, as does the filming of matches by Hollywood. Co Hollywood companies came to Ireland in the 30s to make a short film about, about hurling and they continued to do it during the 40s and the 50s for news pieces, these cine reels that yeah. you see now as part of history were made and dispersed around the world for people to watch uh, Irish sporting events take place and they create stars they create stars like Jack Doyle probably I think Jack Doyle is probably the great forgotten star of mid-century Irish sport for his exploits all out of the boxing ring rather than what he did in it so, so Jack Doyle was known as the gorgeous Gale um, he was a, just a beautiful looking man who has uh, a tenor voice first 10 professional bouts unbeaten arrives to White City in London in July 1933 to fight against Jack Peterson, the big star of English boxing, British boxing, and he's fighting for the British Championship. And he's out of his depth. It suddenly is, it's apparent that this beautiful man can box, but he can't fight. Mm. And he resorts to a series of low blows, and he's disqualified. There are 70,000 people in White City at the fight. Loads of them are Irish in London and there's a riot. They think their man has been done down and he's carried mm. shoulder high into Trafalgar Square around the streets of London. But this unleashes a career where Doyle gets banned from Britain and goes to America. He goes to Hollywood. He befriends Earl Flynn and Clark Gable. He becomes this, um, let's say, magnet for some of the stars at the time. So women such as Judith Allen, brilliant actress, um, takes up with Jack Doyle. Betty Strathmore, another actress, took poison in a hotel in front of him after she discovered that he may not have been as faithful as he thought she would be. Delphine Dodge from Dodge Automobiles. The family paid Jack Doyle $10,000 to stay away from not just Delphine, but also Delphine's daughter and Delphine's sister-in-law, all three of whom seem to have had some sort of uh, a liaison with him until he marries Movita. Movita brings her home to Dublin. Uh, there's these concerts going around the place. I, he's an incredible singer. He sings Mother McCree and other songs, becomes a star. He, he stars in Hollywood films. Uh, you should, I think the, if you can see them on YouTube, there's Sea Navy and um, McCluskey, the Wild Rover, um, neither of whom troubled uh, the, uh, the, the, the award, yeah. the, the people who awarded various things. things. So um, he then, unfortunately, his life unraveled entirely into a kind of a haze of alcoholism. Uh, he died um, into the, the, the early 80s, but for a while he was sleeping rough uh, on a car in Henrietta Street in, in Dublin. But he was made by the modern media mm. of radio transmission and of cinema. And there were other stars in an Irish context. Mick Mackey could not have been the star he was of 1930s without radio and telly. Similarly, Christy Ring and so on across the range of sports. It gave an immediacy mm. and a new layer to, 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 the, to the people feeling connected to a sporting event rather than just reading about it. They could now hear it and hear the crowd in the background. Yes. We'll leave it there for this week. Professor Paul Rouse from UCD School of History. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a million, Joe.